waiting for the little red light to come on. There it come goes. on. Yeah. It is indeed, yeah. Lovely. Okay, Thank evening. you. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our third um, task force meeting. Um, apologies. Ah, oh, right, OK. Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us a little bit earlier than usual, but I think you'll see why as the evening goes on. Um, welcome to our third meeting. And uh, we have some guests who are going to uh, do a presentation for us shortly um, from York Council. So I'll introduce those shortly. But what I'd like to do first is ask you to um, say hello, say who you are. So. Um, I wonder if you, until I come to you, could you put your microphone on mute, please? I'm picking up some background noise here. So that's OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll run down the the list in the um, the minutes. So I'll ask you to say hello in the sequence that they are in the minutes. So um, if you can give a, a quick, just a quick summary of who you are. Yep, Tamara. Uh, Tamara Hunt, the Sustainability Officer um, at the University of Chester. OK, and I think, David, we've now had um, apologies from. So Steve, Steve Hughes. Apologies, just trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Stephen Hughes and I'm chair of the Chester Sustainability Forum. Thank you. Uh, Roy, Roy Newton, I think he's going to be arriving late. Are you here already? I think Roy, Roy's arriving late because he's got another meeting which overlaps with this. Um, Stephen, Stephen Perry. Oh. Well, good evening, everybody. Stephen Perry representing the Active Travel Forum meeting in tonight's discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Bernadette. Hello, Bernadette Bailey from NHS Cheshire CCG representing the Commissioning Health Sector. Great, thanks Bernadette. David Beer. Good evening, I'm David Beer, Senior Manager at Transport Focus, the National Watchdog. Thanks David. Mike, Mike Hogg. Good evening, I'm Mike Hogg and I'm the Chair of the Chester Residents Association Group. Great, excellent, thank you. Peter Bulmer. Hi, I'm Peter Bulmer, Chair of Gritport and Parish Council. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, Alex Bell. Uh, hello, I'm Alex Bell. I'm a member of the Chester Youth Senate. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Claire, Claire Roberts. Hi, um, I'm Claire Roberts and I'm the coordinator for the um, Poverty Truth work um, across the council. Excellent. Thanks very much, Claire. And we have a, a new uh, member joining us tonight, Tim Kenny, but I think Tim's actually sent his apologies yet. So if he's on, no, I think he sends his apologies. And then, of course, we have our valuable secretariat who are here tonight. So we've got Christy. Uh, on mute, sorry, apologies. Yeah, Christy Little, <laughs> Transport Manager, Cheshire Western Chester Council in secretariat role. I would just ask. Uh, Garfield so that Roy Newton has joined um, the meeting since we did the instructions so just to let you know sorry. <laughs> okay no, no problem. Uh, Lynn. Hi Lynn Mackay I'm Cheshire West and Chester Council I'm here in a secretarial role. Great and Stephanie. Hi Stephanie Ward and I'm here from Cheshire West and Chester Council as a secretarial role too. Right and Sean. Yeah, good afternoon, Garfield. I'm Sean Trainer, Head of Highways and Transport at Cheshire West and Chester Council, um, just supporting the meeting and yourself, yeah. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Is there anybody else on the call who I should have included in this introduction and saying hi? Rob, I've missed you, have I? Apologies. No problem, Garfield. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Pickering. I'm the Lead Cycling Delivery Manager for British Cycling in the northwest of England. And I know now why I missed you. And Andy, Andy Farrell. Yeah, we were we were we were apologies last time. That's um, right. That's Andy, right. Andy Farrell, Andy Farrell Limited, representing the Chester bid and now the Chester Growth Partnership. Excellent, thank you very much. And Roy Newton, you're on call now. 
I am indeed, yes. My, my previous meeting finished in time, unfortunately. So I'm Roy Newton. I'm representing the Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership. Excellent. Thanks very much. And Barbara? Yes, I'm Barbara Dean, and I'm part of the Poverty Truth Advisory Board. Excellent. So Thank I'm you very much. Um, we've got Helen Tandy. Uh, yeah, I'm Helen Tandy. I'm, I'm just here uh, observing this evening. Um, I am part of a group called Eco Communities, and we have a event next Tuesday evening on active travel. Um, mm. So I just thought it'd be good to get in here. I think you do have one or two people on here that are coming and being speakers for me in that right. um, event that we're doing next week. So thank you for letting me join you. OK, no problem. Thanks very much. And I've got Mike as a guest. I don't know which Mike right. this will be. Yeah. <clears throat> so Mike Garrett representing Freight. Oh. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mike and Anya. Hi, I'm Anya Mill. I'm representing New Senate. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Lovely, right? Okay, so um, let's move on. And I'm really pleased to to say we have um, some guests with us from York City Council. Um, I saw this presentation of what I imagine is the bulk of this evening's presentation. Um, on an IET, the Institute of Engineering Technology uh, talk just before Christmas. And I thought, oh, this is just, you know, just right up our street, exactly the kind of thing we should be looking at. So I've asked Stuart and his colleagues if they would give the same presentation or close as um, to us tonight so that we can get a flavour for what's being done over in York, but also learn some lessons from the um, the the how can I put it you know the 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 pitfalls that they fell into along the way I think might be a a fair way of saying it so um if I can I'll pass over to um Stuart and he can introduce himself and his team yeah hi good uh, good evening everyone uh, my name is Stuart Andrews I'm a project manager with the transport system team at York and I'm going to attempt to share my screen and hopefully this will work without any hitches let's see if we can get on here. Looking good. Uh, looking good. Marvellous. Brilliant. So I'm joined today. Uh, I brought Andrew Ledbetter along. Andrew Ledbetter is uh, another another project manager at York. Um, Andrew is actually responsible for writing the EV strategy um, that we released um, March last year. Actually, it, it's been quite an exciting time doing EV work in York. We've got a lot going on um, and we have done for several years. Um, so we just wanted to come along today and, and share some of what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing certainly over the next 12 months and hopefully the next five years or so. Um, the main focus is going to be on the, the actual development of our EV strategy. Uh, we're going to try and keep it to public charging only, but we, we do have uh, a, a, certainly a hand in a lot of different EV uh, travel methods, buses, scooters, that kind of thing. So if you've got any questions about that, we're happy to answer them afterwards or contact us in an email. Um, if you've got any questions during the presentation, if you just want to submit it on the text chat um, and Andrew will have a, a pour through them and see what we can get answered today and anything we can't answer, we can we can send a message over to you. So um, a little bit about York, first of all, for those who've never been here or don't know much about the city, it's quite a small city. We're only about nine kilometres across, um, so you can quite easily walk the length of the city in a day. Uh, even in an afternoon. We've got about 210,000 residents uh, in 83,000 households, roughly. About 20,000 of those homes have no off-street parking, and that's going to be important a bit later on. And for those that uh, already know about AEVs, you can probably guess what's coming on that one. About 1% 1 of the vehicles in the city are EVs or plug-in hybrids at the currently, which is about on par with the rest of the country, probably quite way behind places like London, um, but we're certainly not, not above the curve yet on that. Some related issues for, for York that I want to bring up at this point, they're, they're, they're going to become important later on. Um, I don't really want to focus on them too much. First of all, we have a very interesting bus service in York. We've got the biggest zero emission bus fleet in the UK that we've got a lot of uh, electric buses out on the roads and they're servicing six park and rides. Um, and the, the park and rides are, are critical. Like most cities, we have problems with parking and congestion. Unlike most cities, we have six large park and rides that sit around our outer ring road, serviced mainly by electric buses. Um, and these are vital for bringing in our commuters and the seven million tourists that visit the city, visit the city each year. Um, we also have uh, the UK's first voluntary clean air zone within the city centre. So all our buses in there are uh, Euro 6 or better. Again, most of them are electric. 
Um, the EV strategy has not been developed in isolation. This is part of a wider set of projects and measures that we're introducing in the transport team. And again, these are all, each one of these could be a talk in itself, but we're doing things like real time transport modeling, um, smart parking, e scooter trials. All this sort of fits around um, a, a very quite advanced communications network in York. We're one of the most connected cities in the UK. We've got about 70% fibre penetration for a council fibre network that connects all our traffic signals, all our parking systems, CCTV. So we're starting from a good place and we're, we're pushing quite hard on a lot of these measures. Goals are all very similar, um, air quality, carbon reduction, um, reduced congestion. I mean, it's a walled city, so we're, our transport network runs between 14th century walls making um, traffic planning quite a difficult job. Um, as I said, if you want to know any more, anything more about these these subjects, please drop us an email and get the relevant project managers to send you a bit of an overview and they could do an entire presentation on their own right for a lot of these. So our EV journey um, started in 2013. We we're quite a pioneering EV charging city. We had one of the first UK public charging networks installed back in 2013. Um, since then, we've received um, OLEV's Go Ultra Low status, which is part of the reason why we're here today. Part of our commitment to Go Ultra Low is that we sort of share our experiences as we go through our EV journey. Um, and our first attempt at a network, let's say, back in 2013, our first full year of operation saw us getting 1,510 charging sessions. And that's built up pretty quickly since it's been open. So four years down the road, down the line, we were seeing 14,000 charging sessions per year. And our original network looked something a little bit like this. Um, it wasn't huge, but then there weren't many EVs on the road at the time. Um, we installed 20 dual socket fast chargers, which gives us approximately 40 charging bays um, for fast chargers. We also put in five rapid chargers. These are a, a much faster 50 kilowatt DC charger. Um, initially, these were installed for the purposes of bus charging was the, the main reason to charge our bus fleet. Um, but the decision was taken that they should be open to the public as well. Um, this is probably one of the lessons learned that most quickly on this subject. Um, lessons learned from our original network. Let's start with that one. Public charges need to be for public use. Bus charges should, for, should be for buses. One of the, the things that became quickly apparent was while in the early days uh, it was quite convenient for a, a, the, the one or two EVs to nip in and get a, a rapid charge at the bus chargers, as we started getting more EVs on the road and as the buses did more mileage and their batteries degraded and required charging more often, we began to see a conflict. And it's one thing to drive your, your new EV down to a rapid charger and find a bus is going to be parked there for the next hour. How inconvenient. It's a lot more inconvenient for the 50 passengers for the number seven bus to pull up and find that there's a car parked at the charger and it's not going anywhere. So the, the first lessons learned is, is to segregate our network very specifically into public charging, fleet charging, bus charging, and eventually we'll get to the point where we're going to be doing uh, potentially commercial charging as well. Um, second lesson learned, and this is probably the most important one, is quality is critical. If we're going to achieve our targets of, of migrating more people onto EVs, it's really important they have the confidence that the network's going to work. There is nothing more frustrating than an EV driver to drive five miles down the road to a charger that's on your, your Zap map. And when you get there, you find it's out of order. Um, second to this is just the quality of the actual charging bays we've provided. And we, we've seen this a lot with local authorities for that have installed chargers in the early days and we did the same thing. We had some money floating around for some chargers. We didn't really know what we were doing with it. So we found a convenient place, perhaps near to a power supply or just a, a convenient place within a car park and we plonked a load of chargers in. What we find is that a lot of these aren't necessarily in the most obvious places. The signage isn't right. The bay markings may not be correct and it leads to a very confusing experience when what we really want to be doing is treating our EV users with a bit of more of a premium service. And, and again, accessibility is another one. If you just go plonk a charger down at the end of a parking bay, you need to ensure you've got the space, not just to maneuver the cables to charge a vehicle, but we need to account for the fact that some of these EV drivers are going to be wheelchair users are going to require a little bit more space to maneuver around the vehicle. And a lot of times this is not considered, at least in the early days. And that's something we really want to bring into our, our future developments. Thirdly, um, Again, another key to our strategy, we found it very important to start tailoring the types of chargers. 
both to the locations that we've put in those charges and to the types of people, the user groups that are going to most frequently visit them. This is this is really a, a core element of, of how we count with this strategy. Um, all too often you see things like rapid charges in long stay car parks, not necessarily the most appropriate things. Since if you go into a long stay car park, you're probably going to stay there for some time. You don't want to be coming back to your vehicle after 30 minutes or an hour to move it into a parking space. And fourth, we needed a strategy. We needed a, a set of rules, a set of directions on how we develop any future charger installations so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Um, and so this brings us on to the actual strategy itself. So it's been written over about, about two years, released last year in March, um, just before they announced the, the cutoff for um, combustion engine sales. We opted for a five year strategy because it gave us a high degree of certainty. All too often we come to uh, discuss charging strategies in, in other areas and everyone's concerned with the end goal of there being no combustion engine cars on the road or they're all focused on the cutoff date for the sale of combustion engine cars. Future gazing this much gave us absolutely no certainty what we were doing whatsoever. If we backtrack from the figures of 100% EVs on the road to today's date, the number of charges we needed to install was astronomical. It just seemed ridiculous given that we had quite accurate usage figures from the last sort of you know, seven years or so. So five years is a, a figure we can work on. We can quite clearly predict the increase in charging sessions over that period of time. <coughs> we can look at the current trend for sales during that time and we can continue to update our plans during that five years as to the, the number of charges we need to install based on our, our usage figures um, and also just based on feedback we're getting from, from our residents about where they'd like more installations to take place. Um, it's, it's kind of key with our strategy that we, we, we want to encourage the uptake of EVs and not just cater for what's out there. We want to get ahead of the curve. Part of this comes through communicating behavioural change, I'll come to that in a moment, on, on how people actually use EVs that differs from a combustion engine car. Um, and, and secondly, we needed to deliver the infrastructure that will allow the confidence to, to, to take up those vehicles. We want to deliver a really high quality gold standard charging network that's reliable, that ensures we meet demand and, and, and exceeds demand. So there's always capacity in the network for new EVs coming online. Um, and we also needed this to be a financially stable network. One of the problems we had in the early days was um, we, we had this, this grant funding to go and install charging equipment, but no one really thought ahead and there was no funding available for putting in place long term maintenance. So very quickly, you know, first, first few years, you suddenly find that things start to break down. Now, without any kind of uh, set maintenance contracts or any budget, repairs started taking longer and longer and longer. One of the biggest problems we encountered um, is, is just being able to keep our charges online and in working order. Uh, the highest number of charging sessions we recorded in a year was 2018. In 2019, the charging sessions actually dropped. Now, this wasn't through lack of demand or because everyone suddenly sold their EVs. About 50% of our network was offline. It just wasn't working. Um, and this has been a, a, a real issue for us to sort out and, and scrabble to get these things back online and back in working order. Um, and we're now in, in 2021 doing a huge rollout to replace all our kit to sort of resolve that. Um, but having a financially stable network is not just about having the maintenance contracts in place. It's about having the funding to do it. And again, this comes down to tariffs, what we charge people for charging. And, and our goal with this, this strategy is that we charge our residents a fair tariff for charging. And, and without wanting to make a profit, we need to make enough money back from the revenue to be able to maintain the network, pay for back office fees. And, and the long term goal is that when these new charges become life expired, we have enough money available to replace them. Um, without any kind of break in service. Um, the final point is going to come up several times. And I'm going to hold off addressing this till the very end of the presentation. It, it's a big topic in the EV world, which is what do you do with residents that don't have off street par that, um, that don't have off street parking? We've got 20,000 properties. About a quarter of our residents don't have a driveway or somewhere private they can install a home charger. Um, and so I'll, I'll address this later, but that's something to bear in mind. It's going to keep coming up throughout this presentation. 
So let's just talk about the barriers that we need to overcome to get people to adopt EVs. Range anxiety is by far the most commonly referred to barrier to EV ownership. Um, and if you've ever seen Top Gear, I'm sure you're used to seeing Jeremy Clarkson ranting at a service station about how his EV is going to take 90 minutes while James May sups a cup of coffee. Um, Range anxiety comes from a number of things. First of all, broken chargers. We've already mentioned how frustrating that is. It's not like a petrol station where you can just go to the next pump. Many locations only have a handful of chargers in any village or town. If one or two of them are out of order, you may not have anywhere to charge. Um, charge availability comes down to exactly the same point. If your network is oversubscribed, it's highly possible that you'll go to a charging location and find that someone is going to be plugged in there for the next two hours and you're going to have to wait. And the third one is the long journeys issue. Um, people always have this, this real problem of, oh, you know, what happens if I go on holiday? How do I plan my journey? Where do I stop? I don't want to have to sit at motorway services for two hours while my car charges. And again, here it is, no off street parking. There's, there's a, a definite feeling that people who own an EV have to have their own personal charger and that EV ownership is just impractical without it. Now on paper, when we compare a combustion engine car to an electric vehicle, things don't look too rosy for the, the EVs. Your combustion engine car's probably got a range of at least 300 miles, some of them a lot further uh, compared to your electric equivalent. The, the, the EVs on the road now probably have 150 miles plus. In the early days, some of them had as little as 80 miles. Um, to refuel your combustion engine car is a petrol station stop. Your average petrol station stop is about nine minutes. And most people do that once every week or every two weeks. Whereas an EV, your charge times can be nine hours or higher, depending on the charger type. And because of the smaller range, you're going to have to do that more regularly. And that, that sounds pretty awful. The only one advantage on paper you can see for an EV is that with a standard combustion engine car, you have to drive out to a petrol station. You can't have your own fuel supply at home unless you live on a farm, pretty much. Um, whereas an EV, you can recharge at home or you can recharge in a car park somewhere, your local supermarket, for instance. So that's one advantage of an EV. But let's ask a few questions about how you're actually going to be using your vehicle. And most of these issues boil down to two things, range and convenience. So firstly, how far do you drive? Well, for most people, the answer to that is about eight miles per journey. That's the UK average. And that includes everyone from your long distance commuters to your average school run. It all comes down to about eight miles per trip. So even for 150 miles range EV, eight miles is not a real, a real problem. You'd still only have to probably recharge once a week. Modern EVs are now coming out with ranges of 300 miles plus. So going forward, the range issue becomes less of a factor. How often do you actually go further than that, though? Again, very, very rarely. Most people stay within a fairly set pattern. You go to work, you drop the kids off at school and you go shopping and you do it all within a very set area. Your, your, your usage patterns for a vehicle won't change very much. And so unless you're one of these people that does huge amounts of mileage every day at work, for instance, maybe you're a sales rep and travel the length of the country every day, then chances are actually using an EV won't be a problem in terms of range. Um, and, and total mileage you're doing. You may find you're, you're charging more often if you compare this on a like-for-like -like basis of how often you plug in compared to how far you go to a petrol station. Where things get a bit fruity is where do I refuel and how often do I refuel? So your combustion engine, you go to a petrol station, you spend nine minutes, you buy a packet of wine gums and off you go. But wait, how do I do this with an EV? There's no set recharging station. I don't need to go to a petrol station. I literally just rock up to a, a charger in a, a car park. Maybe that's where I work. Maybe that's where I'm shopping. It's not the same as refueling at a petrol station. So for an EV user, the answer is, where do I refuel? Well, pretty much anywhere I park if it's got a charger in the car park. And how long do you refuel for? Again, this doesn't really apply because all you do is plug it in and walk away. You then go do your shopping, you go to work, you pick up the kids. And then when you get back, you want to plug your car and off you go. So we're no longer in a cycle where I'm making a set journey to fill up my car that's going to take me time and require a specific journey to do so. I get into a situation where wherever I go, as long as the infrastructure is good, I should encounter a charger often enough to do what's called destination charging. And I no longer need to focus on an individual charging session specifically to refuel my vehicle. How many times do you go to work and come back to your car and find someone's kindly topped it up with diesel? Never. But with an EV, that's exactly the situation you should find yourself in if the infrastructure is there to support you doing that. 
So with that in mind, let's just break this down into some user groups and, and where we're putting the charges and why. So we use a, a three group model for most of our situations, most of our common sites. The first one being long stay sites. The kind of people that will be using these sites who are commuters, your tourists, and what I like to deter, ter, call serious shoppers. Those people are quite happy going to York and shopping in the town centre all day. Not something I can manage, but something my wife would definitely be happy doing. Um, these people are aiming to stay at long stay parking, whether that's within the city walls or using our park and rides. So we're, we're looking at the primary reason they're traveling is for parking. They're not going there to charge, but if they can charge, great. Average dwell times for these kind of users tends to be around the eight hour mark and it's very predictable times. So if you go to any park and ride, they'll fill up at about 8 a.m. Um, by 6 p.m. they're virtually empty as everyone leaves for the night. In grey here, I've noted again, here's our overnight residence. This, this comes back to the residence without off street parking and this will all sort of fit together a little bit later. Our second user group is short stayers. So these are your local shoppers. So you're not going to the city centre, but you might visit a high street, go to the butchers, perhaps go to a coffee shop, pick up a bunch of flowers, that kind of thing. Um, you might be eating out. You might be a business visitor just visiting York for short duration. Um, these these kind of sites are your high streets, your small shopping centres, leisure facilities like gyms, for instance. So you're normally looking at short stay or medium stay car parks. Um, the main purpose for the visit is usually to do shopping. Charging again is incidental, but if you flip that on its head, this is a, a fast charger at these kind of locations. It might be a good reason to go and charge your car and have a cup of coffee while you're at it. So the, the reasoning behind visiting these, these sites is, is a bit mixed and it depends what facilities are available on the site as to why people are going to be visiting. Average dwell time is normally 30 minutes to about two hours. And these kind of visitors will be turning up throughout the day, again, depending what facilities are there. If it's a local cinema or a gym, you might find that there's more activity in the evenings. If it's a line of shops, it might be busier during the day, but it's, it's generally quite well spread throughout the day. Our third group is our don't stay parkers who literally don't want to stop. Um, these are people uh, either driving long distances or through traffic. The reason for the visiting is generally primarily the charging. There's not any requirement to have facilities on site um, and our don't stay user group would prefer the fastest turnaround possible. We want these sites to be on main arterial routes around York, such as the Ring Road and the, the several main roads we've got coming in and out the city centre. And we ideally want these sites to be really easy to reach for the largest number of people passing by. They're going to be used whenever is required. So if someone's traveling long distance and needs to top up, we want them to be able to get quickly to these sites, recharge their vehicle and move on whenever it's convenient or as conveniently as possible. The dwell time on this site is going to be very low and this is more dependent on the type of vehicle using it and its capacity to charge quickly. Uh, we expect a dwell time of around 10 to 30 minutes for most users on these sites. So the next part of the strategy was to align the equipment with our user groups. So let's go back to our long stay users who have a long dwell time and a very predictable pattern. In these kinds of sites, we opted to take on board to, to install a seven kilowatt fast charger. For those that know a little bit about EVs, there are several types of fast charger. They're an AC charger and come in various powers between three kilowatts all the way up to about 22. Um, the reason we chose the seven kilowatt is purely because it fits best with the kind of behavior we expect to see at these sites. It's cheap, it's low power, it's got two sockets, and a charge time of around seven to nine hours will fill up your car pretty much. You'll be able to do a full charge, even if it's nearly empty when you arrive. Going for a three kilowatt charge, which would be slightly cheaper, means that we've got two long charge times and people can't charge up quickly enough. And your 11 kilowatt and 22 kilowatt chargers are more expensive and the number of vehicles that can actually utilize them is actually surprisingly low. So the seven kilowatt charge gives us a really cost effective option um, and, and the charging time really fits the user model very well. Because people are coming to these sites primarily for parking, we have no overstay fee, but we do expect them to pay for the parking. So if you plug in your electric vehicle, you will pay for parking if it's if it's a pay and display car park, for instance, and you will also pay for the power to charge. If you visit one of the park and rides where we, we don't have a parking charge, um, but you are expected to ride on the bus to get in order to get that free parking. Same applies there. You'll park for free. You'll pay for your charging and you'll pay for your bus ticket. Um, so that's how our long stay as we're working. 
Our short stayers, we opted for a 50 kilowatt rapid charger. Um, they're substantially more expensive than a seven kilowatt charger, but they give you a 90 minute charge time, which is ideal for visiting the local shops or pop into the gym, going for a swim or watching a movie, that kind of thing. Um, you can get about 100 miles range done in about 30 minutes. So you don't need to stay for the full duration. You could just pop in for a coffee. Um, and with these charges, we expect to have multiple charging sessions in a day, whereas our fast chargers at the long stay car parks, we don't really mind if only one person plugs in and stays there all day. With these, we want to get a good turnover. So we're expecting these to be used four, five or more times in a day. We don't charge any kind of parking fee because they're not really designed to be parked par for, for parking long term. But we do have an overstay fee, which discourages you parking up charging and then blocking the bay once your car's finished charging for hours. Our final group is the don't stayers. And for this, we're trying to get as close to a petrol station model as possible. So for these, we're using a very expensive unit, which is 150 kilowatt ultra rapid charger. Currently, there aren't a huge number of vehicles that can use the, the full power of these chargers, but certainly the next generation of vehicles coming on the market are getting close to that. We're seeing a lot more vehicles can accept 100 kilowatts or some 150 kilowatt charges. These things are about as close as we can get to realistic petrol pump times at the moment with EVs. So for 100 miles range, you'd expect to plug your vehicle in for about 10 minutes and a full charge shouldn't take more than about 30 minutes, depending on your battery levels when you arrive. You can quite literally use it like a petrol pump, drive up, plug your car in, check your Facebook for 10 minutes and then leave. We want these to have very high turnover per day. We expect them to be used like a petrol station. Um, so again, free parking, an overstay charge to discourage people from, from parking up and sitting there with the charger plugged in, not doing anything. Um, and we're, we're positioning these in sites where they can be accessed very rapidly by our long distance drivers and and uh, through traffic. So to implement all this, we've secured about £4.2 million worth of investment, which comes from a number of public sources as well as some council investment. Our plan is to replace our existing network of fast and rapid chargers completely, um, and then to install a further set of charge points that means that 5% of every parking space in a council-owned car park in York has a fast charger. So that's 310 fast charge points in total across the city, uh, which is a huge step up. Um, we're also going to be installing rapid chargers normally in pairs at popular short stay locations. So again, we're looking at sports facilities and sort of local high streets where we're going to get a good turnover of traffic. Um, we're also constructing three ultra rapid charging hubs, and this is our version of an EV petrol station, if you like. We have three planned. Um, two on the ring road, two on the outer ring road near our park and ride facilities because they're in a great position um, next to arterial routes into the city. So that's uh, if you're familiar with the, the two locations, one is at Monk's Cross Park and Ride and the second one is at Poppleton Bar, which is another park and ride. Our third site is in a city near the hospital where again, we, we, we need somewhere for, for people visiting some of the, the bigger inner city attractions to be able to top up on the way in or the way out of town. So our hyperhubs are uh, a, bit, a bit of a new innovation. There's, there's plenty of similar things out there, but um, we, we've got a few differences on ours. It's going to be a 24 hour rapid charging hub. Because of the split of vehicles on the road at the moment, we're starting with four ultra rapid 150 kilowatt chargers and four rapid chargers. There's a lot more vehicles on the road at the moment that, that can only go up to the 50 kilowatt limit. And so to save on budget and to save on having uh, a full set of 850 kilowatt chargers, most of which won't ever see their full capacity used, we've opted to split it at this stage. Though we are future proofing, uh, future -proofing the site with large substations, um, extra wide ducting, so that any point in the future we can go and install a full set of 150 kilowatt ultra rapid chargers. And we even have um, plans available to us that if we wanted to go to 350 kilowatt, if that technology becomes viable in the future, we can do. Um, each of the sites uses renewable energy. So we're installing solar PV panels on the canopy that covers the chargers and also uh, PV cells covering parking spaces in the adjacent park and ride car parks. Um, they're also plugged into a, a large Tesla battery energy storage unit so we can save solar power um, and use it specifically in charging. Between the solar and the EV charging, we aim to save about 166 tonnes of CO2 per year. So uh, it goes a long way to meeting some of our, our clean air targets and our carbon reduction. Um, and those are the three sites, Monks Cross, Poppleton Bar and the inner city one at Clarence Street. 
So this was our 2013 network. This is how it looked originally. If we fast forward to, uh, let's say, June this year, hopefully COVID allowing, this is what our new network will look like. So again, we've, we've focused on uh, our inner city parking with um, fast chargers. We've got a much larger fast charger network at all our inner city locations. And we've started to expand out to some of our, our smaller out of town locations where residents might find it useful to have a fast charger. And these are serving some council buildings such as the Town Hall Library um, and out near one of our new school developments on this side. We're hoping to continue to expand the, the number of fast chargers we have in these remote areas. Um, and we're going to do so um, through um, things like planning permission um, requirements. So now any new developments in the city are required to have 5% of charging spaces with EV capacity. So as we go forward, we're going to expect to see the number of fast chargers increase. You can then see in red, we've got our ultra rapid chargers and in yellow, our rapid chargers. Um, and our ultra rapid chargers are based on the ring road. This over here is Monks Cross Park and Ride, which is easily accessible from the A64 and the ring road. This is one of our busiest busiest sites. So although it's a long stay car park, the charging facility is actually a petrol station, if you like, on the outside of the, the park and ride just because of its location. Same over at Poppleton on the other side. Um, we've got fairly good coverage. We're going to continue to work on this. This is just our first year's worth of implementation. And this is how we funded it. So uh, our first set of funding came several years ago from Olev, and this was specifically for ultra rapid charging technology. Now, until recently, this hasn't been affordable. So we've held off until we've been able to do a, a much bigger project. And that's been joined by funding from uh, European Regional Development Fund, along with match funding from City of York Council. Um, the rest of our fast charging network has been paid for from the North Yorkshire LEP. Um, part of the Northern Powerhouse. And we've also had a lot of technical support from West Yorkshire Combined Authority, who've run a program called Energy Accelerator. Um, this is specifically worth mentioning if you're looking at doing this kind of thing and you're missing some expertise in your team. For instance, for us, it was electrical engineering um, and grid connections. Uh, because we didn't have a dedicated member of staff for that, um, the Energy Accelerator program provided us with technical assistance on, on that, that element of design. So that's been very useful. Um, our delivery partners, we've, we've worked it down to two specific partners, BP Pulse, who were formerly known as BP Charge Master until a few weeks ago. Uh, um, uh, we've now have a contract with them for five years to deliver all our fast and rapid charging equipment. They're also supplying their own back office. They're also maintaining all our equipment and they'll also be doing all of our fleet charging. This is really important to our plans for First of all, making sure everyone has a consistent charging experience. We're going to have all the same kit across the city. Everywhere that we have council chargers, they will be BP charge, master fast chargers and rapid chargers. Um, they will all use the same back office. Um, this gives us a lot of security, a lot of stability. BP will control the entire network and that the Polar network, as it's as previously known, is enormous. So any of our users transitioning onto the Polar network as they're preferred tariff will have a huge number of charges outside of York to choose from at very, very um, reduced rates. Um, our hyper hub has been delivered by Evo Energy. Um, they're a specialist in renewable energy, battery storage and charging systems. So they're going to be using ABB ultra rapid chargers. We unfortunately can't have BP ultra rapid chargers. They haven't finished development of that product product yet, but BP themselves use ABB chargers. So we're still going to maintain that consistent approach to charger models and types. Um, but why are we investing um, in EV charging? This is a, a question we commonly get asked. Why don't we just ask someone else to come in and do it for us, a private company? I think the answer to this primarily is that we're in a very unique position to provide strategically located infrastructure. We already have car parks. We already have park and ride facilities around the city in locations that are ideal for this kind of um, charging facility. Um, we can tackle some very diff difficult business cases that the private sector don't want to get involved with. Um, ultra rapid charging is a great example of this. Ultra rapid chargers are very expensive. Currently, we don't expect them to be fully utilised. There just aren't the vehicles out there that can make full use of these charging speeds. And so in order for a private entity to want to install ultra rapid chargers, they've really got to be looking at a very long term business case to make it worthwhile. 
I'm going to quote here, that, well, misquote, as it's always done, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Our hopes is by providing these these ultra rapid chargers that it will encourage people and give them some some confidence to get involved with EVs and, and, and take them up as their primary mode of transport rather than a, a combustion engine car. Um, another great advantage is tariff control. Um, if we just turn this over to private sector, we, we can't guarantee that in the future we're going to be able to give our residents and our visitors a good deal by controlling the tariff and basing our tariff structure on exactly what money we need to maintain our network we think we can we can maintain a competitive price point for charging and again one of the big pulls with ev in the early days has been that it's cheaper to run than a petrol or diesel car i, I think going forward we can see some of the private sector actually driving those prices up so it's no longer going to be the good deal and we're kind of going to lose that nudge to move over to EVs so maintaining control of, of a price point in the city is one of our goals. Um, the final thing is that we can ensure that we've got the coverage we need and that we want so that no residents are left out in the cold with no charging facilities need them so it gives us that little bit of extra control but that's not to say we're not going to invite commercial providers into the city. Um, we've already got a number of sites that are being taken on by Polar, Instavolt, various other places like Podpoint and Tesla are all interested in coming to the city. These tend to be um, installations at things like supermarkets and um, shopping centres, things like that, where the shopping centres themselves don't want direct control of the chargers. They, they just want the facility there for their customers. Um, and so we're, we're totally open to, to private um, companies coming in and installing. And in fact, it's actually part of our strategy to do that. We really want to encourage them to do this. Main reason being that the more chargers are in York, whether they're council owned or not, the faster the rollout rate, the more consumer choice and the better the spread we've got. So we don't necessarily need to go out and, and put a charger on every street corner. We're hoping that private companies will do that, that they'll put chargers in car parks for uh, company employees so they can charge while they're at work. Or, or put them in supermarkets so that your local charger may not be a council owned one, it might be private. Um, again, I'm going to mention this planning uh, condition, 5% of fast chargers at new developments. This, this is really important because it just maintains that, that momentum of rolling these charges out across the city and ensuring that we've got choice, more options for destination charging. Again, the more places you can drive to and plug in your vehicle, the less reliance you're going to have on a dedicated home charger. And we're going to come to that next. On street charging. On street charging is a hot topic. Uh, we get requests constantly from residents saying, I, I, I want to buy an EV, but I live on a terrace street or I live in an apartment. I don't have a dedicated parking space. I can't install a, car, uh, a charger outside my house or in my garage. Um, we're not going to do on street charging as part of our strategy. And here's the reasons why we're not going to. First of all, footpath clutter. We have spent years moving lamp posts from the curb edge to the back of the curbs. We've moved street furniture to the back of the street. We've decluttered our footpath to make things as accessible as possible. We're now faced with the proposition of having to install on street chargers at the curb edge with the added trip hazard of cables and all kinds of bits and pieces all over the footpath. Very good reason not to do it to start with, but then you've also got the power constraints just to install these things. There's a number of solutions out on the market from wiring these things into lamp columns to using telecoms cabinets as, as access points for power. Um, at the moment, we just don't see that's feasible. Um, even wiring one seven kilowatt charger into a, a lighting circuit for street lighting is, is fairly impractical in most cases, let alone doing an entire street of these things. And then you've got the actual requirements to provide power from the national grid to all these chargers. Uh, a seven kilowatt charger is about the same load as a, an entire house. So you, you're almost looking at doubling the number of houses you're powering on the street in, in load terms. Um, there's some more practical issues as well, things that would just cause um, a lot of people to be unhappy or things that just don't work well. If you look at our private streets, they are the terrorist Oh, excuse me, the terrace streets particularly are um, controlled with uh, parking permits, zoned parking. So if you go and install an EV charger for, for number 12, who's just bought an EV, you're going to have to mark out the bay as an EV only parking bay. And what we've effectively created now is a private parking space for the chap that lives at number 12, whereas everyone else is using shared parking. Um, 
Firstly, it's not very fair on the rest of the residents. Secondly, it's going to get quite limited usage because it's permit controlled. Unless you have a permit for that particular street, you can't park in that spot and therefore you can't charge at that charger, even when the guy at number 12 is taking his car off to work. So the actual usage of these things is going to be very low. We expect one person to be using these chargers full time and for the rest of the time it's to be empty. Um, and that one person doing an average of eight miles a trip, 16 miles a day perhaps, is probably going to get a full charge once per week. So even the revenue generated from a single charger used by one person is probably going to be too low to even maintain it. The other problems come with what happens when that person moves house or sells their car. We now have a charge that's potentially not used at all and literally can't be used by anyone because of the permit system. Um, so we end up with a maintenance liability. Other problems with this come with um, the, the location at a curb edge is obviously more vulnerable to being struck by a vehicle. Um, it, the, the, as a package at the moment, we just don't see it works for us and we think we can offer a much better alternative. So we've already talked about destination charging and if you're one of those people that, that has a routine that fits in with the charging network, if we've got the infrastructure right, you may never need to charge at home. You should just be able to charge daily as you go about your business. Um, but for those that, that that doesn't quite fit, we also have some other options. We, we have these long stay car parks that we know are busy from 8 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Um, during those times, um, most people are at work, um, but after 6 p.m. when everyone's coming home and you'd be expecting them to want to plug into their home charger, these car parks are largely empty and they're full of fast chargers that are also empty. So one of our offerings is to open these, these car parks up to our residents out of hours to allow them to fast charge without any parking charges. So if we think about our, our fast charging network and we overlay over that a little blue circle that shows roughly a 10 minute walk time, you can see that we've got really good coverage across the city for those people that would want to park their car up at one of these car parks, leave it for a few hours in the evening and then collect it before they go to bed or even leave it there overnight and collect it for work the next day. We're not talking about doing this every day. Um, EVs, as I said, 200 miles range, 300 miles range coming quite soon. Um, you probably get away with doing this once a week. Um, so we, we don't feel that's a, an awful ask. That's not an awful inconvenience. But if you're outside that area, what do you do then? Well, let's go back to the model of using it like a petrol or diesel and doing a dedicated charging trip, perhaps once a week to charge your car. So if we look at this, red and yellow circles indicate roughly a 10 minute drive to get to any of our rapid or ultra rapid charging hubs. Now, if you're near one of the ultra rapid charging, this becomes as simple as filling your car with petrol. Hop in your car, drive down the road, spend 10 minutes, drive back home, job's done. With the, the rapid chargers, it's a bit more of an ask. You may have to sit in your vehicle for perhaps 30 minutes. But again, a lot of these locations are near somewhere where you could grab a coffee or go do something in the meantime, perhaps leave it for an hour while you go pop down the gym or go for a swim. So with, with all our different options for home charging, we feel this is a, a, enough of an alternative, certainly at this stage, that we don't need to do the home charging option. So I'm going to I'm going to call it there because we're running out of time. We want to get on some questions. Um, Andrew, have we got any questions come through on the chat? I've not actually been watching. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had a few through, Stu. Do you want to do you want to pick a few a few tasty ones? Uh, yeah, well, we've had um, we've had a question about the uh, the bus uh, EV side of it, which I can I can probably just pick up now. So yeah, it's a question about. Um, what what contract procurement strategy was used to uh, to lead to zero carbon bus fleet? Um, so that's really been driven through our park and ride sites. So we we tendered for an operator um, of all six park and ride sites, and as part of that, we brought in conditions around bringing EV vehicles into that fleet. There are uh, there are very good uh, good usage case for EV. Um, they've got fixed routes and it's a relatively short distance. So even the, the early adopter EV technology was suitable for those routes. What's happened off the back of that is, um, is the operator through that experience in York and, and around the country um, has become increasingly confident with the technology. And there's then uh, decided that, that they see that as the future of, uh, of their fleet within York. 
Um, now that's a it's a predominant operator that operates about eighty percent of uh, of all route mileage um, in the area. So, so really the the answer to that is um, we were able to to drive the market in that direction um, thanks to the control that we have over those park and ride sites. Um, I think a few others here, Stu. Um, do, are there any government grants available uh, as government is insisting on all cars being EV in the future? Yes, there's various pots of money available. You've just got to go looking for them. <laughs> um, do, do, do you know the current ones that are up and running, Andrew? Yeah, so on the vehicle side, um, there's a £3,500 grant. Uh, in terms of buying a, an EV vehicle that's available. Um, in terms of infrastructure, uh, if you're a business, you can apply for a grant of up to £350 uh, per socket, and that's up to 40 sockets. So there's support for businesses, charitable associations, and local authorities as well, actually. Uh, so the full gambit there. Um, which is it's an off the shelf uh, product. So you go to the OLEV website and you can download all the information about how you apply for those grants. Very easy to access. Uh, there's an equivalent as well. So if you can have uh, a domestic charger installed, you can also get a 50% contribution towards that. Uh, and then above that, obviously, there's these much larger pots of money. So we're a recipient of the OLEV grant funding through Gold to Low Cities. So it's fair to say there's there's a lot of money available um, from central government. Um, I think what we've demonstrated is we've been able to supplement that through our um, local enterprise partnership, um, ERDF funding, and obviously council contribution as well. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of money out there available. Um, the key thing really is is having a plan in place so that you can pitch to potential investors. Uh, I think next one is... Um, can, can I add to your, your answer there, Andrew? I think you've touched on that. Having a plan in place is vital because a lot of the, the windows you have to apply for this kind of funding is very short. Having a plan in place allows you very quickly to put these bids together, which otherwise you're going to struggle with. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think next question is, uh, how has public perception or acceptance changed over the last year or so? Um, I think certainly there's a lot more appetite for EV. Um, and again, having having the, the quality of network, having the quality infrastructure there, um, really just sort of shift the perception as EV has been inconvenient to them actually being a, a very good option, particularly if you don't do huge mileage. Um, I think we have a big part to play in changing people's perception of EVs. Um, and I think this is also reflected in, in the, the car dealerships themselves. If you start getting a good uptake, if you've got good infrastructure, those dealerships will start selling EVs in your area. They'll start pushing the product more. You'll get a lot more, more publicity for EVs in your area. I think it all adds up. Yeah, I think just to add to that as well, Stu, there's been a seismic shift uh in the appetite of car manufacturers to actually sell ev so some of them have had ev available uh i've really soft pedaled it in the background uh this year really has been a real step change in that which is due to uh eu legislation where they have to hit certain um co2 standards across the fleet uh, and that means they've now actually got a, a monetary push to to actually market ev so what that's meant is there's been a massive increase in the number of uh, EV models coming to market. But we're also now starting to see things like television advertising, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and dealerships are now actually uh, trying to sell those vehicles to customers rather than hide them in the corner. Um, alongside that, there's been a pretty seismic shift, shift in, uh, in the automotive press, um, who are now really on board with pushing EV. So, Basically, 2021 is the year that EV has become far more mainstream. Um, I think also supported by the fact that there's now some very attractive um, company car tax legislation as well, uh, where EV is zero rated for company car tax. So this has all come together, really, to, to see an absolute step change in the market. Uh, so I think the next one, Stu, um, I'll, I'll pick this one up, actually. 
Um, are these charging points pre-bookable? If not, then this is a charging lottery. So um, no, they're not pre-bookable, but what we've done as part of the strategy is um, going back to the advantage that we have as a local authority, we have uh, rolled out the infrastructure ahead of demand. So what we've got is, is managed over provision. Um, so the idea is that you should be able to find an available charger um, at our sites within, you know, within the, the time horizon that we're talking about. Um, we've made a commitment that if we do run out of capacity, we're going to look to increase the number of charge points we have. So that's part of the answer is that we've tried to size the network to, to reduce the, uh, the likelihood of you not being able to find charger. Um, the other half of, of, of the answer is that what we will have is real-time availability data. So you'll be able to go onto the website and see the real-time availability for every socket. So if we've got 20 sockets in the car park, you'll be able to review every individual socket. So you'll never be in the position where you're heading off to a charging location blind, wondering what, what you're gonna find. You'll always know. And if your closest location is full, you'll be able to route to the, to the nearest available one. So because of that, um, we don't have a booking system. And to be fair, um, booking systems, one thing that are really underdeveloped at the moment in the EV space. So we feel the combination of managed over provision and real-time uh, data uh, is, is the next best thing at the moment. I, I, th I think that also comes into destination charging. You know, if you're considering that you're going to a charger for a full charge, you're probably doing it wrong. Most people will be topping up wherever they go rather than just going to a charger to get a full charge. So if, if you can't get a charger at a car park, once the infrastructure's there, it's no big deal. You'll be able to pick one up tomorrow or when you get home or when you get to your next destination. Yeah, the, uh, I'll just pick up the, the next one, Stu. It's quite an interesting one in terms of how many charges will you ultimately need to have available in York to allow you to <laughs> pro rata match the number of filling station transactions? So, um, so the, the honest answer to that is we don't know. So this goes back to the, the reason why we chose uh, 2020 to 2025 as our time horizon. Um, basically, the big swing factor there is whether things like ultra rapid charging become uh, become the norm, um, and also uh, to a certain extent, the the mix of plug-in hybrid to pure EV is really important within that conversation as well. Um, I mean, what we can say is, if ultra rapid charging becomes more uh, more accepted going forward, um, then on paper, you need about twice the number of ultra rapid chargers to directly match uh, existing petrol pump provision, which is actually an incredibly low number. Uh, and there's some national um, study done on this recently, which <laughs> came up with um, with only needing a few hundred uh, ultra rapid charging sites for for a backbone network across the UK. Um, now. If everybody went down the fast charger route, uh, you need an incredibly high number. So what way we've tackled that is we've set out an existing, uh, we set out uh, an initial network. Um, we're trying to steer the market in a direction where we hope that the ultra rapid market will become established, at which point we're not going to need a massive number of charges going forward but we've left our options open so that we can basically respond uh, to market need as it becomes more apparent. Do you want to add anything to that, Stu? No, I think that covers it, but we should probably call it there because we've had our time. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, I think that's been absolutely fascinating. There, there are a couple of um, people I'd like to bring in just for some closing comments from, from our side. Um, Andy, do you want to chip in, please? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, um, Chester, for example, is not that different from York. <laughs> it's, not, it's, a, it's a town, we, a city we, we always compare ourselves to. I know the, the, the boroughs are wide, it's, it's slightly different. Uh, we've got four park and ride sites, you know, half the population of York, for example. Um, 
it, it, it's almost like um, this is a no-brainer, really. You know, um, we've got to prepare the, the, the borough and the city particularly for EVs coming along. Um, uh, York have got a very sensible plan, or probably in terms of UK cities way down the line compared to others. It's almost a pick-up-and-shift plan almost. Um, uh, and you can even start in some of the park-and-ride sites uh, and use the, the same sort of process. Actually, it's, it's something you just perhaps we just get on with, Sean. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing in terms of money is um, I'm actually amazed it only costs £4.5 million pounds, um, because £4.5 million pounds is actually peanuts in transportation infrastructure terms. Um, uh, so it, it's about priorities. I mean, the average transportation scheme costs about thirty million or something. Um, so this is this is actually very affordable in that respect, and would make such a tremendous difference. Okay, thanks, Andy and Sean. Do you want to just kind of reply on behalf of the council, perhaps? Yeah, thanks, Gareth. And firstly, thanks to colleagues over in York for that for that contribution. As Ooh. Andy says, very very much the the synergies within our respective respective places and, and that's why we're really keen to hear um the case study that, that garfield's kindly facilitated for us here and we have been looking at other um similar exercises as well as part of the ongoing bus service review task force that councillor paul roberts is is leading so very much endorse the, the the points that andy's made there um we are we do acknowledge that there's there's a way to go um, we're, we're behind the curve very much, I think, as as you all were a, a, a time ago. Um, but at least we recognise that we are commissioning um, a piece of work um, currently. Um, our colleagues in, in Warrington, uh, co colleagues and neighbours, our colleagues and neighbours in Warrington and Cheshire East um, have recently developed strategies. So again, certainly no need to reinvent the, the wheel and actually a sub-regional approach I think will be helpful for consistency for users as well. So we're on with it, um, Andy and colleagues, um, and we'll we'll engage with you along the way of that process as well. And I think you're right; it's a it's a no-brainer. We have got some initiatives um, that we will be delivering shortly. So we've been successful, and we appreciate the funding that the, the local enterprise partnership are helping us with um, with the facility in Ellesmere Port, at the around the um, Waterways Museum. Um, which will be a, a sort of a, a public and business facility there as well. Um, the Northgate development in, in Chester, the, the new multi-storey car park, will have a range of, of charging points um, built into that, that new facility as well. And then colleagues in regulatory services have secured some of the oil of money um, to deliver some um, charging facilities in, in public car parks um, as well near to terrace properties. Um, that won't have that that on street um, facility as well. So, over the next um, three to four months, you'll see more charges appear in in the borough. But that's only the the sort of tip of the iceberg. We've we've got lots more to do. Excellent. Thanks, Sean. So, thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Thank you very much, Andrew. And. Um, I uh, hope that one day we can return the favour and, and talk to you about some of the exciting things we're doing over here as a result of what we're doing in the um, the uh, Sustainable Transport Task Force. So thanks again. And thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, uh, do you want us to take a copy of these questions and we'll uh, we'll see if we can get back to you with some other answers, if there's any, any good questions in there? Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. All right. Fabulous. All right. Thanks very much for having us anyway. We'll see you later. Thanks very much indeed. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now. OK, thank you. So um, what time is it now? We'll have a break. So it's 18.34 now, according to this clock here. So let's say um, 18.40. Yeah, six minutes. OK, thanks very much indeed.
That was really good, Garfield. Yes, it was, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I'm just wondering, we... uh, uh, it's something I asked, but I probably will get a response. It'd be useful to, to, to know how much of their transportation funding has gone into it, because I think they've used, it sounds like they've used alternatives funding sources. Well, certainly they said that um, the uh, part of the deal, if you like, was that they would share their experience. Yeah. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that you know, we'd be able to get a lot more information from them um, on this. Um, so how are we doing, everyone? Um, let me just move over to the... I've got Mike here. We've got... I've got my hand up for some reason. I don't recall putting my hand up. But there we go. Got it now. OK, let's begin then the second part. So thanks very much for um, coming back. So if I go down the um, agenda, then we're at item six. Um, can I ask if there are any declarations of interest um, regarding tonight's session and things we're going to be discussing? If you can, um, and perhaps if I could ask people to use um, your hands up only if you want to contribute to this, and then I'll ask you to speak at the appropriate time, please. Um, we've got a lot of people on the call this evening, and um, we've got a lot of work to get through as well. So I'd appreciate it if you could kind of keep your, keep your comments short and to the point, and um, we, we can try and get through this agenda then. OK, so down to item seven, we've got the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, so thanks. Uh, Christy, Lynn and Steph for pulling these together. Um, I'm firstly going to ask if anybody has got any corrections that they feel were, um, you know, uh, misinterpreted in those minutes. In other words, if I can accept these as a true record of that meeting. OK, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And if we just very slowly go down the minutes, I think you'll find that most of the matters arising um, we dealt with from the first meeting. Um, there's nothing in the early pages. Please, people, stop me if you feel there's something there that um, we're not going to be picking up on later. But I think going down to six olders were, were tackled in the next page. So 6.1, 6.2, the terms of reference have been updated and they are now on the site, I believe, aren't they, Christy? Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. OK, great. Um, and will be action during the meeting. So I think all of those items there um, have been addressed or have been absorbed into another point. <clears throat> so uh, I'll stop there. So uh, Margaret, Margaret Parker, councillor. Oh, you've got to go. You've got to have your hand yeah. there. Yes, I have. Sorry, sorry yeah. Chairman, I forgot to mute, uh, unmute myself and put the camera on. Uh, okay. Going back to 6.2, when I asked about the meetings being webcast, and I've had an explanation of that, but I believe that uh, um, this option will be reviewed. Can I ask that that does happen and that will continue, that you will look to webcast future meetings when possible? Yes, indeed we will. Thank you for that. Thank you. OK, so we'll go down on to the next section. And we then broke out into the the task groups and with more to say on that towards the the end of the agenda today. Um, and then if we go through this, because I'll be referring to that in um, ooh, item 12, I think, when we get there. And then down here, there is one outstanding topic. Um, 9.2. Um, 
Office to arrange a meeting between the Chair and Councillor Roberts to discuss the links, opportunities and synergies between the task force and the bus service. So that's taken place. Um, I had a lovely um, meeting with um, Paul Roberts, Councillor Paul Roberts the other day, which was very, very useful indeed. And there will be some links between the work he's um, undertaken and the reports he's about to produce um, and what we'll continue so that there is definitely a kind of continuation of some of the threads that they developed in that particular task force and our own work. Um, but also at the same time, um, we will be bringing in um, advice from people like Stagecoach and other people who we might bring on to the task force as and when we feel relevant. Um, one of the things we did in the um, community real partnership meetings, which I chair, um, is to bring people like Stagecoach in when a particular theme arises and we'll maybe um, build one of these meetings, one of these task force meetings around the concept of, of buses so that we get everything kind of um, in the one theme of meeting and get people along to talk about that. So I think that was Stephen Hughes who also suggested that in an email. So thanks, Stephen. I hope that's um, uh, kind of um, answered that one for you. I've got a query from Mike. Yep, Mike Hogg. Just to say, I thought that the York's using the contract for park and ride as a lever to move forward on environmental aspects of transport was very interesting. And it would be in, uh, good to find out which particular bus company is helping us to do that. Yes, indeed. Yes, that is a good point. We'll note that. Thank you very much indeed. OK, so that's the um, minutes of the last meeting and the matters arising. So if we go down to item nine now, um, which is the um, A51, A5116 um, bus lanes project. Let's get another piece of paper here. So colleagues will remember that at the last meeting, um, our meeting was taking place exactly at the same time as a council meeting. And in that council meeting was a, a discussion about this particular topic. So it was it was not suitable for us to discuss it at the meeting because we just might have gone in a completely direct, different direction to um, what the councillors were discussing. So the, um, the, the resolution was discussed. And if I can just quote from the um, official minutes of that meeting, um, the 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 matter raised was that the um, experimental active travel lanes have resulted in severe traffic congestion, causing long queues of standing traffic and increasing car emissions detrimental to residents' health and commuter travelling times for motorists, thereby discouraging shoppers and other visitors from coming to Chester, which I think is a fair summary of, of some of the, the points I've seen raised. Um, so um, the reply from that was that the council believes that any evidence approach must evidence based approach, sorry, must assess the environmental health and social impacts of the EATLs, as well as understanding usage of different transport modes, undertaking an analysis of footfall and dwell time and reviewing the feedback received from business owners and residents. The Council resolves to request that Cabinet review the evidence collected as part of the AATL trial and understand recommendations from Sustainable Travel Task Force ahead of considering the removal of the AATLs. This process should be completed within the earliest practicable timescale. So I think that's very clear. Um, it was passed back to us and we now must kind of address the point that have been raised there. So the way that we're going to do that is to set up a project group, a subgroup, um, specifically looking at this particular project. The reason for doing this is, is really that we want to move as quickly as possible on this. And I've, I've asked um, Stephen Perry, who's come forward to actually set up this particular group. And I'll be asking Stephen in a moment to um, outline his initial plans for this so that we can actually get moving on this as quickly as possible. 
Um, there is some data now available, which um, I'm going to be organising the distribution of for people who would like to use that data and look at it. Um, and I'm just going to ask Sean in a moment if he would just kind of outline the, um, if you like, the future direction that he'd like to see within this particular project. And then I'll ask Stephen to um, suggest how he's going to start the project off. So um, if I can just ask Sean first, if you can make a comment on this. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, just a, a couple of opening opening remarks there. I think you you mentioned the, the availability of the initial data sets, um, which we've we've shared with with um, with, with some interested parties um, and, and members as well. So that is available um, to people on request. And I think Garfield, you've, you're going to help facilitate the distribution of that from a sustainable indeed, transport yeah. task force as well, which which just might help um, ease that ease that distribution. So that's welcome. I think from my my perspective um, of, of this, um, speaking on behalf of, of of the sort of councillors highway authority here, is that um, they're obviously the emergency active travel fund tranche one um, lanes um, our trial facilities. Um, and we're midway through that that trial trial period at the moment, and it will be evidence led in in terms of future future decision making. And we welcome the very much the contribution of the Sustainable Transport Task Force um, and the recommendations that you'll you'll generate in due course. I think this this group um, on the participation participation that I've heard to date is is very much pro active travel and. The disagreement is over the form and, and nature of the schemes that have been introduced um, on the A51 and the A5116. And I, I suppose my request um, and sort of advice to the to the group, and I know full confidence in in the way that Stephen will will take that forward. I'm sure he'll share the details shortly. Would be if people have got a a concern with the type of initiative that we've we've introduced there. Then I'd certainly welcome suggestions on what alternative form um, of active travel support um, that they would recommend um, in in that area. And, and certainly speaking on behalf of the council, we very much welcome that that constructive dialogue. If there's a a, um, a, a meaningful suggestion of that we can do these things differently and reimagine that space, I'd very much welcome that that conversation with with interested parties with interested parties there because as as this group has indicated in the terms of reference specify there's a huge challenge um to to undertake in terms of health and well-being climate emergency support for for reinvigorating the city center and other locations across the borough active travel will play a significant part in that just happy to to engage in in constructive dialogue and and just urge people to to come up with suggestions if they don't feel the correct ones are in place at the moment and let's redesign that space in a different way. Thanks, Garfield. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sean. So I think that the the remit is very clear. Um, we have to produce evidence and we have to talk to people and we have to get the feedback from everybody who's got an interest in this particular issue. And that's what we're going to be doing. So, um, Stephen, you, you've landed this particular project. Um, yeah, you've got some initial thoughts, I think, haven't you? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, can you hear me OK? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Garfield. <clears throat> I, I think I'm looking forward to this challenge. I, I've written down that I am, um, <laughs> but it'll, it'll need support from a lot of people in a sense, but also a relatively small number of people. So I think the message I want to give is that um, the likelihood is that we'll split the, the working group, we'll call it a working group, into two subgroups. Those subgroups will work closely together and in parallel as necessary. But clearly it makes sense, I think, for one of those sub subgroups to look at the Liverpool Road, the A5116 uh, issue, and the other group, the A51 in Borton. Uh, and I very much in, in the coming, and I, I'd like to say days, but if it's not days, it's going to be short weeks or short number of weeks, um, to bring that, to, that group together um, <coughs> and that group to begin to define our own terms of reference against the the requirements set by this task force as a wider body <clears throat> and the local authority to answer the question. Um, 
And therefore, I'm putting out an open invitation to anybody, whether they're task force members or people sitting in or people are not sitting in, but know of others that would like to be involved to um, come forward if you'd like to be involved in this task force. And again, the, 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 the two subgroup groups um, with the caveat that the group, the group must be representative. Um, it will be relatively small. I'll ask individuals that play a part in that in those groups to represent other bodies and other organisations as appropriate. So uh, we, we can't in a sense have everybody speaking at once, but I'd like to guarantee that anybody that puts their name forward, even if for practical reasons they can't be formally involved in the full working group, that they will be part of the process. They will have discussions um, with either me or another member of the group. So I want it to be inclusive. There are practical issues about achieving that, but that's what we intend to do, to be inclusive. Um, whatever route you choose, sorry, I should say now, the, the, there are a number of routes in which you can put your name forward. Um, if you wish to put a comment um, in, the, in the chat uh, of this meeting and add your contact details, just in case they're not there, but particularly mobile phone and email, then um, the secretary will pick that up and pass it to me. You can send an email to um, uh, to Garfield. Uh, Garfield, I'm sure, will uh, explain that email address if you haven't already got it. Or you can send it to the transport strategy email at Quack. Or find any way, other way you like. I mean, lots of people know my email address and I'm happy to share it anyway. But um, whatever, whatever route you choose to put your name forward, um, as I say, please feel included. And even if for practical reasons we can't include everybody, please feel included through other members if necessary. In addition to what I might call the core group, um, then we would certainly welcome input from other representations from other local resident groups and business community. We want it to be a, a network of relationships that we build on. Um, important other communities like the Chester Growth Partnership, um, and some other external experts that might have particular information. We, we, we've seen the benefit tonight of getting what I would call benchmarking experience from other, from other cities and other organisations. And I think that's also be, going to be quite critical. Uh, both Sean and Garfield have, have uh, used the word fact-based, and I think it must be fact-based as far as we can. But I'm also mindful that collecting data at the moment, and even the data that has been collected, people may not feel is representative. I don't think anybody knows what normal will be, and therefore we don't really know what representative will be. But I'd like to make sure that uh, in the process that we take, we establish a clear understanding of what the authority wanted to achieve with the bus, bus lanes and all that went round with them. We want to understand that the, the, the deliverables, the targets, and the, the various ways of measuring those deliverables and targets from that exercise. But I'd like the team that we work together to, to think seriously about, you know, let's just look at those roads, the roads which are causing some concern. And as a group say, you know, if we were trying to meet those objectives, what would we do? Let's think about what we would do and let's, let's ask others for their advice on what we could do or could have done. And then back fit that into what we have. And then that's where the challenge comes in. So it is going to be facts based, but it's also going to be based on inspiration and creativity and benchmarking others. So again, let me just re-extend re that welcome to everybody to come forward if you like to be involved. And I, uh, I do look forward to doing it, Garfield. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Appreciate that very much indeed. I think as Stephen said there, um, we would like applications from people. We, we'd like some kind of substance behind the application so that we can kind of judge exactly, you know, what contribution you, you're going to be able to make because we, we want to get a balance. We want to get a balance across the different types of people who can help us, you know, the residents and other people who've got ideas and people who work in similar kind of areas who could actually contribute in a different way. So we want to try and get that balance right so everybody's represented. But then again, we don't want to a huge group so if you if you could accompany your kind of request with some kind of background that gives us reason for why we should um in, include you i'd be really grateful for that i put my email address in the um chat um so please feel free to send me um your requests or you can send them to christy if you'd like um similarly you can use my email address if you've got any other kind of queries you've got on any of the other topics that we are covering within the task force and if you didn't catch that, it's garfield.southall.sttf 
at gmail.com and that'll be in the recording as well. OK, thanks very much indeed. Um, I haven't got any hands up, so but I've seen plenty of comments coming through the the chat. So those um, comments there will be part of the recording and they'll also be kind of written down as well. So I've got plenty uh, to look back on afterwards. So thanks very much indeed. OK, if I can now move down to item 10. Um, oh, sorry, Sean, you've got your hand up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Gaff. I'll just just yep. one question from Councillor Parker there in the chat, which which crossed my mind as well. I don't know whether Stephen can just just come back in on that or, or yourself, Garfield, just in terms of the time scale for that. For I suppose the outcome of the of that working group Councillor Park is probably asking about. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so the the if I just go back to the the resolution, what was it as? Um, within the earliest practicable time scale. That's tricky. We've got a pandemic on and the the notion of doing measurements of things of traffic and of usage and of cyclists and things like that is going to be, I would say, relatively meaningless because we're, we're not comparing it to any known norms. But we have to do something. We have, we've got a, a period whilst the lockdown is going on where we could have got time to look at this and come up with a recommendation. So we've got a really interesting little situation here. My aim would be perhaps two months and then we really should be getting back with a solution. And that's that's not that long when you think we've got to get everybody together and start working through and getting evidence from people, getting experts and so on into it. So um, it's going to be a, a tall ask for Stephen, but I think that's the kind of pace we're looking at. And obviously I'll be helping out with the group as well, but this is the kind of pace we're, we're looking at. Um, Councillor Parker, you've got your hand up yet? Yes, uh, thank you for that clarification, uh, Chairman. So uh, we're expecting probably about a couple of months. I would think so, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure I've, I've, I've explained that to Stephen yet, yeah, but we do know that it's very quick and we knew that it was going to be a, a quick turnaround for this particular think, thing. Just yes, and I think it needs to be, Chairman. Thank you very much. Yep, yes. maybe, maybe like, sorry, I haven't got my hand up. Apologies, Scott. But just, just really to... Uh, I, would, I would like to think that within two to three months we've got something significant to say. Um, it may not be the final answer. It might have uh, rough edges, but I, I, I'm... I'm very much committed to driving this as fast as we can manage. Um, and, and as I say, if we can't get the data, we'll still come forward with our thoughts in the most constructive way we can. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll be giving the um, the task force updates um, at the next meeting and interim if we if we if we need to. OK, thank you very much. So I'll move on then to the next item, which is the, um, the pilot studies, item 10 on the agenda. Um, colleagues will remember towards the end of the last meeting when we were uh, discussing the feedback from the various um, groups, the breakout groups that we had, um, that um, we should develop some pilot studies. And I was I was really pleased to see a lot of recommendations coming through from people about different areas and the, the suitability of those areas. So um, oh, thanks, you put the slide up. Could you put that up to? That's it. Great. So we're suggesting a couple of series of pilot studies. Um, the first one you can see is detailed there, but there will be a second one, um, which I'll explain in a moment. So the um, the pilots you can see there, I'm going to ask each of the people named there to, to just give a few words on that particular area. But the idea is that each of these pilots will focus on a particular geographical area and they will be largely run by people within that area or people who've got an active interest, in, if you like, in the topic of that area. Um, I've listed a, a, a task force contact there, but that's really to kind of make sure that we've got kind of, how can I put it, accountability across all of the, the pilot studies and we're, we're kind of sharing best practice. Or if there's a bit of expertise needed by one group, we can go to another group and perhaps borrow that expertise. So that's why we have these particular task force links there. But it's very much our view that the individual areas should um, if you like, have a major contribution to running those particular pilot schemes. There's a lot of work to do on this, and you'll see that as we as we move through this particular point. But the um, 
The first area that we're, we're going to look at is the Southeast Chester one. So if we're going to look at the next map. Great, thanks. And um, so David, David B is um, offered to look after this particular area, which is also um, subject to an S106 at the moment, which I might just ask Sean in a moment if he could perhaps give us an update on where we are with that particular thing. But um, over to David. Thank you, Garfield. Um, so yes, the, uh, the red line um, outlines the area that we're looking at. Um, so this is largely based on um, five parish council areas, really, that um, if, if people are familiar, they came together to look at a cycling plan for South East Chester. So those are the parish councils of Great Borton, Littleton, Christleton, Waverton and Huntington. Um, so it's based on those areas, but it also extends into um, Chester uh, railway station. Um, so, and, and depending on how this um, uh, progresses, that may be tweaked and that the, the red line isn't sort of sacrosanct in any way. Um, but really, um, it's a, it, although it's based on those cycling areas, um, it does need to include bus, train, private vehicle, as well as cycling and walking um, and uh, more active travel. Um, so um, that's the, the sort of area that we're looking at and we need to look at the, the terms of reference and um, the sort of content and um, the, uh, the, the needs of that particular area and the priorities uh, that need to be drawn out of that. Uh, so really what we're asking for is people who, um, as Garfield um, has said, are within that area um, that uh, have a, an interest in that who can draw out those priorities um, and again a, a varied um, set of people um, please to uh, be included in that um, but as Garfield says please be prepared to roll up sleeves and, and dig in for uh, some difficult work ahead um, so if you can um, make yourselves known as Garfield says he's put his email address on that chat so have a look at that and um, please let us know um, if you're interested in joining that that group for that particular area. OK, thanks, David. And I, I suspect that there will be a few people. We had some really interesting comments in the group I was um, leading last time. Um, so um, I know that we will get some um, some useful contributions there. I'd also just like to um, thank uh, Peter Bulmer and John Beckett who have been very, very useful indeed in um, helping me kind of plan the initial idea for, for using this area as one of the pilot studies. So thank you very much for their, for their, um, their contributions. Um, Sean, did you have anything to say about, uh, about the S106 status? I'm not quite sure where that sits at the moment. Yeah, thanks, thanks Garfield. I, I, I think just, just in, in general terms, um, obviously there's a, a Section 106 planning obligation relating to the uh, the site and camp developments, um, which I think just finally occupied. I think in recent in recent weeks, one of the last the last properties there has taken occupation. So there's a, a sort of red line boundary um, for for investments in 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 transport um, solutions and improvements, which is is broadly that that red line that's shown on the on the on the image there. Um, a number of investments have been made already over the years um, since the commencement of that development from from bus services through to pedestrian crossing facilities um, and there's a there's a number of, of committed um, improvements as well um, that were that were advancing currently so such things like raising the, the height of the parapets over the a55 um, bridge to ensure safety for for pedestrians and cyclists there um, as well but there is, a significant um, sum of funding still available through that section 106. Um, so, and again, the, the the established parish councils that fall within that geography are, are very well aligned um, and constructive um, dialogue with the authority and some up, upcoming meetings are in diaries as well. So, I'm I'm sure um, David, there's a there's a well established network. Some of the the names that have been mentioned there, along with others. 
of the parish councils that are the membership on this task force as well will very much help you um, through that, that sort of working group um, as well. I'm sure it'll be very constructive. Thanks, Garfield. OK, thanks very much, Sean. OK, can we move to the next um, slide, please? So this looks rather like a mitochondria inside a cell, doesn't it? But it's not actually, it's a <laughs> Chester, Chester City Centre. And um, I think, Andy, you, you'd, you'd like to talk about this one. Yes, this is um, a, a pilot which the Chester Bid and the Chester Growth Partnership are really keen to uh, to enable for the Sustainable Transport Task Force. Um, and this, what this is about is, um, and it needs to, to run in very much in parallel with the Council's review of its one city plan for Chester, uh, which has just been kicked off, I understand. Uh, so it needs to run in parallel with that and feed it uh, as well. Much of the um, uh, transportation leaps Chester has made, park and ride systems and bus lanes, putting that aside for a moment, um, uh, all happened pre-smartphones and Uber and um, digital re uh, retailing, electric vehicle, ginger scooters, uh, electric bikes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, we're starting to use and interact with our uh, urban areas um, in a very different way using technology nowadays. And indeed, the management of our urban areas, particularly transportation networks, is very different now in terms of um, technology. This is all kind of part of the kind of smart city thinking. Um, so what this pilot is, is, is about is um, taking some of those leaps in technology um, and some of the social media and other forms we we now interact with and will interact in increasingly into the future um, to look at smart mobility for um, uh, the centre of Chester. You can see the, um, the, the boundary there and it's kind of networks of links um, out to the zoo, uh, park and ride systems, etc. That's that support and feed uh, the town centre. Um, very much uh, about sustainability, but very much in terms of uh, enhancing uh, the you know the the economy of the town centre, which is, which is struggling uh, at the moment. So it's all about looking at uh, smart mobility. Uh, it's a bit ill-formed at the moment. Uh, and there are workshops being held uh, with the bid members and uh, we're talking to uh, the growth partnership as we speak. I need to interact with Gemma uh, Davis of the, in, in, in City Council to feed into the One City Plan. Um, but it's all about kind of mobility hubs, um, uh, micro mobility, personal mobility um, systems such as e-bikes, e-scooters, as well as the car, electric cars, etc. cetera. Um, looking at uh, intelligent corridors, um, uh, looking at a mobility marketplace, perhaps, which is commonly called, whereby you know, people can interact with transport choices uh, in a digital way, uh, in a more interactive way, in a more intelligent way. Um, uh, an innovation center to start looking at the development of some of these platforms and programs and initiatives, such as, EV charging um, uh, and looking at how we build upon that to access key opportunities such as uh, jobs, education, retailing, health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, suggesting that um, the bid and the growth partnership and Destination Chester, perhaps that group of uh, destinations in and around Chester, and CRAG, because this is all about people living in the town centre as well, the city centre as well, form a core to this working group, run in parallel with the One City Plan review. Uh, but I guess there'll be lots of people interested in this, knowing the attractiveness um, and interest people have in the in the centre of Chester. So I'll be very open for, for people to, to come and join the group. I'm trying to keep it small to, be, to begin with, to, to kind of form some idea of scope. Uh, but we can broaden the involvement uh, as we develop. Time scale, um, again, I need to um, interact with uh, the council's growth team in terms of their um, timetable for their review of the one city plan, because that probably will set the timetable. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, Mike Hoggart, you've got your hand up yet? Uh, just to say that one of the reasons we set up CRAG 
was because of the democratic deficit in not having a parish council in the city centre. And therefore, Andy, we'd be absolutely delighted to work with you on this. It's called for our interest. Good link. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much indeed. And to the next slide, please. And um, here we have the, the Upton area, which is um, the, the next area that we'd like to consider as a, a, a pilot study. And now Stephen's um, suggested he might actually set this group running, but it's, as you gathered, Stephen's already going to have his hands quite full. So I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the main idea really is that we have a lead on the task force who can set up a group and then the group themselves can actually start looking at this with, with kind of a light touch really from the task force members. So I, I shall help Stephen um, set that up a little bit, but I'm sure... Um, and um, he's got plenty of plans, Stephen, haven't you, for this? Yeah, thank, thanks, Garfield. Um, I mean, we're that we've, 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 uh, we're looking at three out of the four pilots so far, and they're all quite different. They're different in terms of their size, their nature, and also their starting point. Um, we've got the South East Chester team that have been working together very closely for a number of, well, maybe even a year now, certainly long months, um, kind of focused on cycling. So they've got to broader their, broaden their uh, perspective. Um, in Upton, I'm familiar with two or three names that have come forward in making suggestions to both Garfield and, and Sean, and I'm sure they'll be champing at the bit to be involved. Um, but uh, as the other case, I see that the task, the, the, the group, the, the pilot group objective is to look at the task of the task force, the, the, the terms of reference of the broad task force, and say how do we apply it to our little area as a pilot to test things out, to look at sustainability issues that we can develop within our area. Um, I'm assuming that the area will be the parish council, the area as shown on the map, um, and, and the key body that will be at least present, pr providing some of the representatives will be the parish council. I'm making assumptions, and if those assumptions are incorrect, don't worry, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, Sean's, uh, Garth has already strongly emphasised this is this is your project. It's the locality's project, and we're here to help facilitate and, and support as necessary. Um, so obviously, it's going to be an iterative process. We're going to come up with uh, the team. We're going to talk about what the terms of reference are, what the scope is, etc. Um, we may consider specifically wanting to include a bit more of the zoo as, a, as an area. I know the zoo is on the map there. We may want to include the Council of Chester. We may want to spread slightly to some of our neighbours in, in Newton and uh, the Moston area. I'm, I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying I'm open to thoughts and suggestions. Um, and certainly within that that group, even though we'd like, we might have a core team of um, predominantly residential representatives and community representatives, I'm sure we want to include representation as necessary from the bus people, the rail people, the park and ride people. So, as I say, I think it evolves. And, and to talk about timetable, it, as with all these things, it's a bit of a guess, a stab in the dark. But I'd like to think that by the next task force meeting in a month from now, we could have set up the, the names in this working pilot working group and we could have agreed the terms of reference and we might have some first step plans in place for, for moving forward. So that we're going to push quite hard, hopefully, to satisfy the, uh, the excitement that I know some people will uh, uh, have around this subject. So I'm looking forward to being with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And if I move on to the next um, slide. So this um, is uh, an area that I'll be looking at, and this aligns with the work I'm doing with the Community Rail Partnership, the North Cheshire Community Rail Partnership, um, which is a, a kind of a, another area that um, one of Sean's colleagues is, is helping me with. And this kind of runs down um, from Ellesmere Port down towards Chester and then across to Frodsham. Um, the, the reason I particularly like this one is that I think that the connection between Ellesmere Port and Helsby 
um, I would expect is going to improve um, hopefully over the next couple of years if things go according to, to plan. And I also see that the, the Hellsby and Frodsham and down to Delamere area is such an outstanding area of beauty that I think that we should be linking transport wise um, these areas together much more easily than is possible at the moment. Um, this opens the way up for all kinds of cycling and walking activities and we also we have um, colleagues in the Frodsham area who are at the moment um, uh, have actually published maps with the council out at, out at Frodsham on cycling and that in the area. So this is something which I want to use as a different kind of project, but also because um, as you can see um, in St Elton in the middle of that particular area, um, we have the Protoss development which is just by the word ins, just to the right of the word ins there. And that's, you know, around 5,000 jobs, I believe. That's a huge area. And there's got to be all kinds of interesting problems coming up there with how people get to work there. Because you can see that most of the population will be either in Ellesmere Port or in Hellsby and Frodsham. So we've also got a kind of a transport issue there to deal with. So I think this is itself lends itself, you know, ideally to being a pilot and sitting alongside the uh, community rail partnership project that we have going at the same time. So this is one that um, I'm particularly interested in and I'll be working with the Ellesmere Port Development Board in, in getting some people in that area to, to help me with this. And again, if you if you're interested, please drop me a line and um, I'm sure you'll be very welcome. So thank you, colleagues. Thank you to those who volunteered um, to help with these projects. Um, I've not received any further hands up at all. So um, if you've got any questions that you'd like to leave in the chat, um, we can look at these um, um, later on. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next item, um, Mini Holland, is is one which um, I was it was new to me. I'm just getting my notes from earlier here. Um, but a few people emailed me in the intervening um, month and said um, they, they'd like to be considered for a Mini Holland project. So obviously I had to look this up and, and find what it was. And I found this was um, a project initially um, launched by uh, Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London for his second term. And he set up three pilot projects um, in the London area um, to be called what, what, what they were termed at the time, Mini Holland, to try and take some kind of inspiration from the way that the Dutch have really kind of mastered the idea of, of, of cycling, living alongside um, transport of, of different types. And they seem to have made a really good job of it. Up to In most of the cities there, you're looking at something like 40% of the, the tra traffic there is by bike. You know, so they've obviously got something right. So Boris launched this thing called Mini Holland, and that was funded by uh, Transport for London. And one of the um, schemes which kind of was was reported quite extensively at the time, and certainly there's a there's a there's a large Guardian article on it, is um, Waltham Forest in the north of London, and they um, were given thirty million pounds, which they um, added fifteen million of their own to to start this project off, and it took six years, and at the end of it there was a, a noticeable increase, eighteen percent increase on year year on year with um, cycling and I've forgotten the number, 13% uh, for walking. So that's obviously works and it, it was deemed to be a um, success. So that was then quoted in the new um, gear change paper, which came out earlier last year. And a few people have kind of picked up on that and said that, you know, that would be good if we could do one of those projects. Um, but I think I'm right, Sean, in saying that we haven't actually had any details through from central government about how this would roll out nationwide. So as yet, I don't think that we've got um, an actual plan of, of what we would need for such a project, have we? No. Sure. I, I, I think that's that's my understanding too. It's a clearly a headline um, in in the in the gear change um, announcement. And I think my my advice and, and and sort of recommendation here is, and, and you are following it as a as a task force here, is that it will inevitably be um, a competitive funding 
process. There'll be lots of interest by local authorities across the country. Um, so that's to be expected. And so get yourselves in a, a state of readiness, really. And I think those sort of trial sites or initiatives that you've you've talked through the Garfield um, is to, to be ready for those um, competitive funding bids when they're announced in, in more detail. Um, because again, the, the, the timescales for submission are invariably very tight as well. Um, so be prepared, um, I would say, and, and, and those areas that you've identified, I think are probably the areas that would lend themselves then to, to inform that in that inform that process. So very much endorse the work you the work you do. And as soon as we hear any more, we'll share that with the group as well. Thanks very much, Sean. So yes, I mean that that's that's right. What we need to be doing is to be ready. We we need to kind of if if they're going to follow the the um Transport for London plan fairly closely, then what we need to do is kind of at least have something that looks roughly like that. So um, I think that one of the pilot groups, or maybe two, but obviously there's, I'm considering the amount of work there is to, for people to do here. Um, but we need to kind of align ourselves ready so that if an announcement is made, um, we we can be ready to put forward a plan. I know a few people have, have emailed me and they may be on the call tonight. I think, um, is, is Alan Evans on the call? Yep. Yeah today? I'm not sure if he is. No, Andrew Evans, sorry, apologies, Andrew. Did you email me on this particular topic? I, I did, Garfield, yeah. Yes, so do you have you, uh, any thoughts on on this particular thing that you'd like to add now? Uh, just echoing what Sean said there, I think this is the kind of thing that needs to be community-led um, with, you know, in advance of anticipation of funding being made available or, or as York have shown being able to find funding from some other means if necessary mm. um, so yeah that's all I'll add to that though thank you okay cheers the um going back to our, our introductory talk then today um colleagues will remember in the last meeting I said it was going to be um, a talk given by Groningen um from the Netherlands who are one of these cities that are a uh, uh, you know, held as being um, the top of this particular type of project. Um, they've gone into lockdown, a, a quite strict one, and the, the contact that I have out there is having to um, teach um, his children during the day and then do his council work in the evenings. So unfortunately, he was um, he was not able to to give the presentation. I'm really hoping he's going to be available next month. Um, but if not, he will be in due course and um, it'll be good to have um, 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 as some advice from him and then we can ask him questions. I've just noticed Craig's just put a, a comment and there's a congestion nightmare. Well, OK, we, we can ask him about that, can't we, when he's here? So hopefully we'll um, we'll have that talk in a couple of weeks. OK, I think that's that particular item. So the, the last item I've got really for the agenda is just to kind of ask you to turn your attention to the minutes at the the last um, plenary session feedback in its item eight of the minutes. And I was going to ask um, if we could pop up this. There we go. You've got it there. Well done. Thank you. So the meet the the breakout groups that we had at the the last meeting were very very useful. They've come up with so much um useful um material as Stephen alluded to in the um the bit about um upton we we need to take on board the comments that are made here so um and make sure that they kind of absorbed into whatever kind of local schemes we're considering so this stretches all the way through from from the the bus lanes project through into the four pilot studies but also into any kind of working groups that we might want to consider for the future um so we're not going to discuss these now what i want to do is to kind of do a little bit more work on these so that they're kind of in a more presentable form they're a little bit still kind of ad hoc at the moment and we've had an awful lot of work to do since the last meeting with them um, and with christmas in between so we haven't really given these the full whack yet but we will do for the next meeting so i just wanted to kind of say to you that all these points that you raised last time are really invaluable they're just like gold dust to us because it gives us so many ideas and they will be incorporated and hopefully you'll see the benefits of that in 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 the future meetings um so i just wanted to kind of just 
leave that with you and say that um, if anybody's got any other ideas and they've suddenly thought of something, as I say, just email me and um, we'll incorporate them. Thank you for that. So we're down to um, any other business. I have not been notified of any. I'm happy if anybody wants to, to raise an item that we you feel would be appropriate. The only um, one I want to kind of mention is that along with the, the data that um, we've been given for um, the, the bus lane project, we've also now been given a load of data from the Ginger um, electric scooters people. That's only arrived at tea time this evening, so I, I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with that just yet. But it's, it's interesting that that seems to have been um, a success. Um, they seem to be getting well used. I think 10,000 rides was the last figure I saw mentioned, um, which is which is good indeed. As, as usual, we've got a few people who, who didn't quite use them the way they were supposed to, but um, that seems to have gone down quite well. So that's upcoming as well, perhaps for the next meeting. I might have some analysis of that data and um, show you some, some graphs and things like that. So David, you've got your hand up, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Um, you were talking about the uh, the pilot studies and the four pilots that we've got. Uh, yeah. You did say you were going to go back and mention series two. Uh, and, uh, yes, well done. And I noticed there's a question in the chat about one of the other areas. So I just wondered if it's a, an opportunity just to outline your thinking on series two, please. Yes, I know that question came from me. So if I if I ask it now, it might shape your shape your answer, Garfield. It was just um, it, it looks it looks slightly like the like the South's been overlooked um, slightly with the Lage, Curzon Park, Hambridge, and then also now um, with uh, Wrexham Road and the thirteen hundred new homes going there. It's um, population wise, it's quite a quite a large area, and I think warrants um, warrants a, a, a potentially at least consideration of of a group in the same same way that the um, that the other four areas have but yes carry on sorry that's okay no no problem I, I, I mean that that's perfectly valid in this you know we we've picked the areas if you like that have got a certain amount of work already done and a certain amount if you like of, of um, traction with other projects that were going on such as the community rail partnership such as Chester bid such as the s106 so these if you like were um, I wouldn't call them low hanging fruit, but there were things that were already had some kind of substance. Yep. So that that enabled us to actually start on those projects fairly quickly and have something there that was collateral that we could work with. I mentioned on that slide, and, and thanks, David, for pointing it out. Um, series two and series two really is where I want people to come forward and say, OK, well, we'd like to be considered for that, whether it's Winsford or Hanbridge or, or wherever, and come forward with, with some ideas, just like the people did for the, for the last ones, so that we can actually put together what I call series two. Um, I'm going to come back to that point again in a moment, Stephen, but that's a direct answer to, you, to your question. <clears throat> Have I got another hand up here as well, I think? Just trying to sort it. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, sorry. Just uh, addressing your uh, question, Stephen Hughes. Um, uh, I understand, and I'm sure Garfield is going to say, you know, we are not going to stop at four. But I, I like. I don't hope Garfield. I hope um, Sean doesn't mind me saying what I'm now going to say. But but to me, the big vehicle for you in the uh, in the area mentioned is the uh, LC Whip. The area you defined is extremely close to my heart as being a party to putting together the LC Whip. It's the primary uh, route into Chester. It has all the attributes for attention. Um, I'm, I know Sean can't do everything, but we should be knocking on that to LC Whip door and getting it open quickly to get some action forward on that because these things are, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a conflict in terms of resources, but they're complementary. So don't feel left out, please push. OK, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, any other business from anybody at all? I've got no further hands raised here. OK, I just want to make a, a, a closing comment in that you'll have seen the the work that we've done so far. And, you know, considering that Christmas has been in place, we've, we've moved things along, you know, fairly nippily, I think, since the last meeting. Um, we've got a lot of work on board and we do need help with these projects. 
And I think the whole point of having a task force like this is that you've all got expertise in one area or another, which will be valuable to us. So I'd really appreciate it if you could kind of think about how you could contribute to one of these groups or even in the centre, if you like, to, to kind of help us oversee some of these things, because we've got a lot of work to do. And you've seen that it's the same names kind of coming forward to to help on these projects. So give it some thought and um, drop me an email if you'd like to contribute in either one of the groups or in some kind of central role as well. OK, so I think without further ado, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Thanks very much. It's it's a long stint, but it's been just over two hours. So thanks very much for that. And also, I think I'd like to add a few uh, and thank a few people who have been so helpful with this. Um, I'd like to thank Christy and Lynn and Steph for, for looking after us and the, um, making all the admin go so smoothly. You just don't really notice it, do you? But it's it's there and it's working. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Sean. Thanks very much indeed for your constant input and, and keeping us on the, the straight and narrow. I'd like to thank Andy, David and Stephen for picking up these groups and, and running with these particular projects. But also I'd like to thank all of you that have written to us um, with your suggestions. They will all be looked at and they'll all be kind of um, worked into some framework or other. Um, so thanks very much for attending. Um, take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Hello, I think we're alone now. <laughs> I think so. I'll just stop the recording. Just bear with me.